Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome. My name is Andrew Jack from the Financial Times. So it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to one of these uh, plenary sessions on non-communicable diseases. So a very obviously important theme which will be running through um, the events over the next couple of days. Um, we've got a great panel. If I could ask them perhaps please now to come up onto the stage. So we have um, Haral Hannes, Princess Dira Mired, President-elect for the Union for International Cancer Control, um, the Honorary Dr. Rajita Sanaratne, the Minister of Health, Nutrition and Indigenous uh, Medicine for Sri Lanka, Dr. Gaudan Galea, Director of the Division of NCD uh, and Health Promotion for the WHO Regional Office uh, for Denmark, Katie Dane, the Executive Director of the NCD Alliance in the UK, and Stefan Ulrich, who's Senior Vice President and Head of the Global Diabetes Franchise in Sanofi. So we want to make this session, which goes till 2.30, uh, as discursive as possible. We're going to start with uh, some opening remarks from the princess and then have a discussion with the rest of the panel, but very keen in the second half of this um, event this afternoon that we open it up to your uh, questions and comments and reflections as we go into this fundamentally important issue. But first, let me turn to the princess for some opening remarks. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, advocates, colleagues, and friends. We are here today in beautiful Berlin to talk about where we are in our fight against non-communicable diseases, NCDs. How much of the commitment made by member states in September 2011 at the second high-level meeting on NCDs has actually translated into action on the ground? How far are we from our target goal of reducing mortality 25% by 2025 and by a third by 2030, especially in view of the upcoming WHO NCD meeting in Uruguay and the NCD review at the third high-level meeting in 2018? Those of us here today already know that NCDs, including cancer, are a global health and development priority. The reality is that NCDs still continue to rob us of our loved ones. NCDs still kill 40 million people every year. Cancer alone, 8.8 .8 million annually. Accounting for 70% of all deaths globally and 80% of which occur in low middle income countries. What's more, 38% of which are premature deaths, which to me means tragic, unnecessary, avoidable deaths. We also know that women and children in low middle income countries are particularly at risk from NCDs, where three million women between ages 30 to 70 died prematurely from NCDs in 2015 alone. And children, despite cure rates for many of their NCDs, especially cancer, are high, suffer disproportionately in low middle income countries where diseases like leukemia, for example, leukemia ALL, with 90% cure rates in developed countries translate into 10% cure rates in Africa and other LMICs. These deadly statistics speak for themselves. As Margaret Chan aptly said, NCDs are a health emergency in slow motion. We as advocates have not been silent. We have placed NCDs on the right path to improve this unacceptable status quo. And we have already seen wins. In 2011, from first high-level meeting on NCDs, a global action plan was agreed in 2013. And in 2015, NCDs were included in the elite club of sustainable development goals. And more recently, we have pushed for a new updated cancer resolution adopted by member states. So we now, we have our own acronym, targets, KPIs, all global mechanisms in place. And yet, the rate of progress has been extremely slow. In fact, the current rate of decline in premature mortality from NCDs is a mere 17% between 2000 and 2015. 
absolutely insufficient to meet our targets in saving lives. What we need to do now is ask ourselves tough, ask ourselves tough questions, acknowledge problems in order to find solutions. Why is there, despite all these global mechanisms, a lack of national action on the ground? Where do we need a kick to the system to get things moving? How do we involve people outside the health system, health systems whose actions help to decrease the number of people developing NCDs? How do we make sure that people with NCDs can access the care they need? More importantly, how do we get people to care enough to invest in the issue. Many reasons come to mind. I would like to pinpoint a few whom I think prevail above all else. The first block is mental barrier. The most effective barrier that NCDs, including cancer, has constructed is probably the damage to our psyche. The feeling that it is too daunting an enemy to face off with, too overwhelming and too costly to deal with. Giving NCDs the most effective tool in battlefield tactics, leading us all to surrender before we start and enter into a long-term lull state of an astounding denial, stupor, and inaction. Whilst we have broken down the global denial, we now have to break down those myths at the national levels. There is certainly no shortage of success stories being done. At the grassroots level, as, pre as president-elect of UICC and previous director general of the King Hussein Cancer Foundation in Jordan, I have seen firsthand how organizations are working to reach out and actually deliver prevention, early detection, treatment, and care services for people with NCDs. The second reason that I can think of is about political will. There are many countries who sign up quite willingly to all kinds of declarations and resolutions, put their hand up, but NCDs remain not on their priority list of national strategies and action plans and simply does not feature on their to-do list. And if the will is not there, simply nothing will happen. And this was shown by countries like the example of Uruguay, who are so lucky to have a president like Dr. Tabare, Vasquez, who understands the implications of laying the foundations of fighting NCDs from now. By sheer political will, President Tabare led Uruguay to becoming the first country in South America to ban tobacco, for example. The saying of where there is a will, there is a way rings loud and true, and the opposite is true. Thirdly, and this affects many countries, there is a real lack of expertise in the management of NCDs how to strategize and put long-term plans at ministry health levels. I see it in my own country, where the minister is usually burdened with day-to-day -day tasks, and there is no HR capacity at the ministry level to actually take stock, strategize, and make well-thought-out, achievable plans and actions to move the NCD fight forward. So even with the best of intentions, the actual infrastructure of management of public health at ministry level is simply not there. Fourthly, LMICs still see this as, an, as a responsibility of the health ministry alone. There are no cross-sectoral connections. Ministers still do not recognize that our work sits at the heart of public health and also at the intersection of development, education, trade, agriculture, and many other national and regional and global priorities. So how can we change this tra deadly trajectory? How can we convince member states that they are already so behind and there is no time to waste and remind them that it is their responsibility to provide a healthy enabling environment to their people? I believe that changing the trajectory is possible. We need to continue nagging, screaming and shouting on behalf of the 40 million souls who are perishing simply for lack of action on the ground. Globally, we as advocates still have much to do. We as the global community also need to walk the talk. And that is our inclusion of a life course in everything we do, in every resolution, SDG, policy document, article and target. We have already seen the devastating effects of omission 
and non-acknowledgement of a health issue. Let us remember the struggle it took us as the NCD community to actually have a mention or a line item in UN high-level meeting and later to be included in SDGs. We need to explicitly include children and women as the vulnerable target audience in the fight against NCDs. And what about mental health? We also need to recognize that there is no health without mental health. All these issues have to be mentioned in every article and every policy. We should not have to fight for their inclusion. As otherwise, when it finally trickles down to a functionary at the National Ministry of Health level, do not expect him or her to read between the lines. He or she will only follow what is before them. Let us also remember that women and children all also represent the opportunity for change. They are the change agents we have to, that we need to implement NCDs. We, the adults, forget that all our life-forming habits start in childhood. Our eating habits come from memories and tastes at our mother's dinner table. That determines whether we, have, we love fruits and vegetables or we love snacking on junk food as we get older. And the same goes for physical activity. In fact, two-thirds of premature deaths in adults are associated with childhood conditions and behaviors. And behaviors associated with NCD risk factors is common in young people. We also need to look at youth as the new power crowd. We need to include children and young adults as an integral part of the global NCD discourse and not as passive target for policies. Today's youth generation are the very people who will drive forward the sustainable development goals and transform our societies to the future we want. Secondly, we, the global community, are correctly calling for multi-sectoral collaboration. However, calling for multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approaches is not enough. We also need to change the way we support countries who truly lack the management expertise on how to operationalize NCD action plans. I would welcome the establishment of the new NCD disease management team and this team to be adequately, adequately resourced to be able to provide ongoing customized technical guidance the developing countries are requesting. I believe that this is crucial step and will give no excuses for member states to actually start doing. With this support, countries can actually start on the right road to build strong health systems, learn how to adapt and integrate systems in place for fighting communicable diseases and help them to move forward towards universal health coverage, having a dedicated NCD management team, hand-holding their efforts will help will help countries fast-track their progress and avoid trial and error approaches. At the national level, much has to be done. Countries need to take responsibility as well. Governments need to stop hiding behind the issue of costs. Yes, funding is important, but our problems or countries' problems and solutions are not always about money. There are numerous interventions that need not much investment at yet and yet can impact the health of the country's population. In fact, the Global Action Plan brings together the most effective measures we have to reduce the global NCD burden, as well as treat and care for people with NCDs. We have solutions and successes, so we need for leaders in low- and middle-income countries to exercise the political will needed to spur action. Secondly, governments need to acknowledge NCDs in the right channel. Knowing something does not in, in of itself translate into doing. The proper acknowledgement of a disease is having its own line item in the budget, preferably in capital letters, large font, bold format, and colored in red, denoting no time to waste. And once NCDs have the rightful place in national budgets, ministers can then strategize, plan, and seek technical support from the global community on NCD management. In addition, governments need to be reminded that it is their responsibility to provide a healthy enabling environment for their population. It is not a lifestyle choice in many cases. In fact, I totally abhor the word lifestyle. This mislabeling puts the blame 100% on the individual 
and totally absolves the government's role in the primary responsibility of protecting their population. For a start, governments have to stop tobacco and alcohol companies from targeting our youth and to sign and ratify the FCTC. It is absolutely shameful that only 30 member countries have signed to fight the single most proven causative factor for the rise in mortality from NCDs. Most importantly, governments have to recognize the multi-sectoral connectivity of the problem and have to encourage multi-sectorial collaboration. They have to recognize that it is not a choice. It is part and parcel of the solution. Without it, any plan will fail. And here I want to share with you a new and amazing new initiative launched by UICC that represents a new paradigm shift in how we can jumpstart actions on the ground. C City Cancer Challenge 2025 is an initiative in which city leaders are asked to build new partnerships to improve cancer treatment and care services. What is remarkable about this in initiative is its model. In, in that, it takes into account all of the barriers of action that I have discussed above. CCAN 2025 will only sign up with countries who have the political will to invest in cancer. Once they, they, they say they are committed, CCAN team then asks that, will o that it will only work with them also if and only if they agree to work on a national task force that includes all the players, NGOs, patient groups, private sector, public sector, etc. Once the city takes on the challenge, CCAN team pledges to fulfill the technical management gap of the process and promises to support the city for three years. And at the core of it all is the making of one comprehensive national assessment self-plan. Once the gaps and priorities are identified, an action plan is designed with solutions in collaboration with the city leaders, coupled with a twinning of expert global leaders. It starts with the plan. It is condition of multi-sectoral collaboration, political will, and so on. So it is doable. We, the global community and national community, can fight NCDs. We need to change the way we solve the problems and in the right order. It is morally, we also need to remind ourselves that it is morally imperative that progress has to move fast enough for those people who are actually living with cancer, diabetes, heart disease, chronic respiratory conditions now. And whilst we are only eight years away for catch up to reach our target for 2025 by reducing mortality by 25%, it is important to remember every day that we are only a breath away from a dying cancer, diabetic, heart disease patient waiting for deliverance. Thank you very much. Th thanks very much indeed for those um, thought-provoking uh, ways to trigger off this discussion. And of course, you talked about this whole gap around um, the political will and commitment, really, and what needs to be done. So as we go forward with the discussion, I think I'm very keen that we try to really throw this forward very much and think about what, what models are actually out there, what is being done, what are, perhaps, if I can put it this way, the secrets of success that um, colleagues can share that they've seen to therefore hopefully um, stimulate greater action rather than just rhetoric. And Sri Lanka, of course, Minister, has done some very important things in this area. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit um, with your reflections about what the big challenges were and how you have uh, been able to get some traction. Do you want to pick up the... Um, yeah. That's fine. It should work. Just, just, just speak. Yeah. Actually speaking, we have... We have uh, from the, after 2015 with the new government coming to power. We came into power for the first time in the country having a uh, <clears throat> very important dialogue on the health system in Sri Lanka and the health situation in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> so uh, the main problem in my country is that because we have actually <clears throat> contained uh, the, uh, the the communicable diseases called 
we have got rid of uh, polio, we have got rid of malaria, we have got rid of hilaria, and all most of the other uh, communicable diseases also. Uh, about by 2020, we want to eradicate all of them except HIV and dengue. So the main uh, challenge for us is the actually <coughs> the non-communicable diseases. About over 68 percent of the hospital deaths are due to non-communicable diseases. So we have taken a lot of actions against that. One is the cause is the tobacco. So for tobacco, we have uh, uh, um, actually done the pictorial warning on the cigarette packet, 80% from 2015 a warning. And we are going to uh, implement the pain, pain packaging system also for that. Uh, the last year, we uh, increased the taxes from 70% to 90% for taxes, all tobacco products. With that, about 46% uh, it has come down, the smoking. The smoking, they are <coughs> actually, uh, their sales have come down by over 1 billion sticks for the last year with this section. <coughs> and also, I'm going to take uh, the... Next uh, action would be that uh, single stick uh, sales will be banned. And also, again, uh, and I have already submitted a cabinet paper to ban sales of uh, tobacco products around 500 meters around schools. The second thing is about the sugar. Sugar, last year <coughs> I implemented the, uh, the system, actually traffic light system for green, amber, and red. So over 11 uh, grams per 100%, uh, percent, it is the red color. So you know all the Coca-Cola and all the multinational products were over that and red color. Their sales came down drastically. Even the youths were uh, very watchful in the, uh, and they come and they see the, what color is the patch and then they take, uh, they buy uh, the the drinks. <coughs> so with that, their sales came down, and they brought down their sugar level by ten percent. And uh, they are the Sri Lankan uh, country uh, director told me later that their main company, the global company, is also going to implement the same system. And now I have brought legislation uh, to tax uh, the higher level of sugar uh, products. That is over 6% of uh, sugar, over six, uh, 6 grams per 100 milliliters. If anybody has any sugar products, that every excess of uh, 1 gram will be taxed 1 rupee in our currency. And also that <coughs> we have uh, taken uh, uh, actually uh, uh, and the the problem is that about the prices of drugs. So that is one reason because the people couldn't afford the drug prices in our country. So I have uh, with the international marketing services, with the support of their data, I have brought the maximum retail price for all essential drugs. That means 48 general, generic drugs, which has about over 400 brands in my country. They have been drastically, uh, the prices have been dropped by about 80% by some prices came one-tenth of the price. The <coughs> so that was the big ra uh, profit range for them. So with that actually uh, 400 drugs came down and also the cardiac stents. The prices I brought down by uh, one-fourth and also the cataract lenses for those people with due to these problems actually that uh, uh, they are suffering but they can afford. So, and also in the hospitals actually the, we have a uh, free health scheme from 1951, no charges, but there were charges for, uh, but uh, the people were requested to bring the cataract lens, bring the cardiac stent from outside. Now we are providing everything free of charge for the people. And also there was a limit for cancer patients uh, in our currency rupees 150,000 uh, um, about, no, 
about uh, yes, uh, one and a half million. After 15 lakhs, uh, 1.5 million. Uh, that is the quota for everybody. Now I have removed all the quotas. Now for a lifetime, we provide all the cancer drugs. So like that, we have taken a <coughs> lot of action in all other fears. And also we have a program with the Ministry of Education where we have given a canteen policy for the uh, schools where only the um, good food is to be available without starch, without fat, salt and sugar. So, and also we have uh, uh, set up uh, uh, NCD corners in schools where they will check the BMI uh, and all other tests for the <coughs> students. And also we have given one booklet for each student, entire student population, how to, uh, about the good food and exercises and for a high healthy lifetime. And there was a, another problem for the people of my country is that uh, even to do a health checkup, because we only do the treatments in the hospital. By that time, he has got the disease. So for that, um, <coughs> to prevent it before that for a health checkup, there was no system. Only the affordable people could go to a private sector hospital and get a health checkup done. So I uh, started 842 healthy uh, centers uh, health lifestyle centers, 842, which is very commended by the WHO, and they came and they visited these centers where we do the BMI, the BP, sugar, cholesterol, uh, all tests were done, the basic tests. And then we refer to the uh, clo close by uh, the nearest hospital. And also for the women, we have set up the well women clinics, another 929 all over the country where they check all those things, plus the, they will check for uh, breast cancer and the pap smear. So all these, uh, with the measures, our target is by 2020 to bring down the NCDs by one third. So it's a very impressive list of interventions. <laughs> Just give, us, just give us a sense of how challenging it, it's been to politically to, to introduce those, both with your fellow you know, members in the cabinet, but also actually potentially with opposition from you know, industry manufacturers, some other groups that might have wanted to push back. How easy was that process? There was a lot of uh, difficulties, uh, the, especially when I brought down the, uh, the drug prices, the entire pharmaceutical industry rose against uh, the decisions, <clears throat> but I uh, brought them down. I had uh, many discussions, and then I brought down the importers, then I brought down the distributors. The distributors, they supported me, and with all that, we brought down, and then <clears throat> a certain um, multinational company said that I have brought down their price uh, uh, less than their manufacturing cost. So then I said, uh, because I had all the manufacturing costs in my hand with the international marketing service data. So then I issued a statement because they blamed me and uh, in the press and I issued one statement saying that I have the manufacturing cost of your products, uh, but it is not ethical to announce that. But if you challenge me, I'm ready to uh, announce the prices. The next day, they agreed to uh, comply with my <laughs> prices, and they said they will uh, actually advertise in all the papers. There were three more uh, products, actually, <coughs> uh, very, uh, actually uh, the very popular brands. Those three companies, they withdrew their products from the market and created the shortage. So then I have my state pharmaceutical corporation, the state hand. So I told them to actually write to the principals, asking for the agency if they don't sell the products there. With, uh, so they uh, applied for the agency. Then in uh, then the other the those uh, the present agents, they wanted two weeks that they will comply with my listing. After that, there was no problem but I will extend this uh, maximum retail prices for other products, other pharmaceuticals also. 
Okay. I'm sure there'll be plenty more questions in the second half when we come, come back uh, to the audience, but let me just go around the, the other panel first. But, Gordon, maybe coming, uh, you might want to perhaps respond a little bit to the Minister. Obviously, WHO has developed all of these um, best buys. You've got a series of frameworks in place. Tell us a little bit about, uh, well, how that matches with perhaps the best policy interventions that could be made and what should, what should come next, actually, both Sri Lanka but elsewhere. Thank you, Andrew, and, and thank you to both the previous speakers. <clears throat> Apologies for the voice. I, uh, uh, I, I'm really amazed that both uh, the first presentation summarized quite nicely <coughs> the global situation. And here we've just been hearing uh, from Sri Lanka stories on the front line of policy making. And what I really love is that immediately the moment you get into the front line, you're no longer talking the airy-fairy language of win-win situation. We need to understand what the other sector, we need to speak their language, we need to put health second to the other objectives. You have to fight, um, uh, and you have to uh, really uh, battle with vested interests, um, be they from whatever uh, source, to get the outcomes that you are looking for. I'm going to take a risk. I'll, I'll do a couple of, thing, of polls. Um, so how many people here, uh, first one is a warming up, I hope uh, quite easy. So how many people here know that we are committed uh, to a 33% reduction in mortality, premature mortality from non-communicable diseases by 2030? So raise your hand if you know about this. Okay. A surprising number of people don't know. So uh, just to tell you that the sustainable development goals um, do include a target that uh, globally, as well as nationally, we will expect to see uh, a one-third reduction in premature mortality, measured as deaths between 30 uh, to 69 years of age. Let me give you another simple question, how many years are there between today and 2030? Um, is it uh, five years, is it 10 years, or is it 20 years? Which is the closer? Um, how many think it's five years? Okay, no one. How many think it's 20 years? Oh, wait, how many think it's 10 years? There's the, okay, people are, are waking up slowly. But here's, here's, the, here's the point I'm trying to make. We have committed to reduce by one-third the premature mortality from non-communicable diseases in the people aged 30 to 69 globally in 10 years. Um, are we stupid or what? Uh, the, the, the point is, uh, how do you do that? Um, did we set ourselves up to fail? Uh, so I go uh, to asking you, this can't be done with a finger, but to actually think about it. You need, in your country or in your organization um, or in your region or, or in your alliance, uh, to advocate for some things that will reduce by 30%. And this is, okay, the 30% is not between now and 2030, it's between uh, 2010 and 2030. So over that 20-year period. One of the things you would do is, of course, as we are doing in WHO very well, lamenting the fact that we are nowhere on the route to do this. We are failing, um, and if we keep going as we are with the business as usual, unless we take really dramatic action, such as we are seeing in Sri Lanka, we are uh, going to fail. But there's another aspect to that, is we need to also look at where we are succeeding. And now here's the bit of good news, that there is one region um, in where, uh, Europe, where if you look at the 53 countries of Europe, I'm not just talking about the European Union, I'm talking about the, the high-income countries of Europe, the, the West, typically, as well as Central Asia, um, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, 
uh, Turkmenistan. Um, so we're talking about the full swathe of Europe. If you look at almost every single country, you see that we are declining as a region as sub-regions and as individual countries, this number is declining at a rate which, if it persists, will result in a 33% reduction, if not even a 40% reduction by 2030. So there is a lot to be learned from those, okay, you might think that Finland is too Finnish and, uh, and Denmark is too Danish, but is Tajikistan to Tajik for you? There, is, there must be a model in, uh, somewhere in Europe where, because of these rapid declines that we are seeing, that something can be learned. So I leave this, this part of the question for later discussion. But first of all, if we keep going as we are globally, we're going to fail. But if we look for pockets of success, we have them. 53 countries, I can, uh, I can name them. So we can learn from some successes. Now, there are some things that we learn that become extremely obvious um, for us to do, and yet we don't mention them. Um, so here's, here's a, let, me, let me bring one of these up. Let me, let me, let me use a word, um, the gender perspective on non-communicable diseases. Now, when I say this, be honest and raise your finger. Did this bring to you a picture of um, cardiovascular diseases not recognized in women? Um, uh, ambulances not switching on their siren when their patient is a woman, but doing it when, uh, when their patient is a man? Um, women's burden of being unpaid carers for people with stroke or, or with long-term chronic disease. For how many of you does the gender perspective on NCD conjure up images of this nature? Hands up. Okay, five. Um, uh, so for the rest, you're thinking about the men. Shall I just say, uh, how many of you does it conjure up the opposite, that the gender perspective needs to value uh, the life and health of men? Well, no one. Okay, uh, this, is, this is struggle. Uh, you, you expect it to come and be spoon-fed rather than... Uh, <laughs> shall we do it again? <laughs> gender perspective on NCD. Who votes for women? Okay, now we get an answer, mostly women. Who votes for men? A very small number. You see, this is an extremely difficult question to answer, and I, I, uh, in, in this almost funny way I, uh, that I'm trying, to, I hope it's funny, um, uh, 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 that I'm trying to, uh, to bring to this audience, I'm challenging you to, to actually look at some basic assumptions that we make. So, um, anyone who looks at the evidence on premature mortality from non-communicable disease would have no hesitation in answering this question. Men, uh, 30 to 69-year-old deaths are almost exclusively for an NCD in men. So you can't have a gender perspective on non-communicable disease, and you can't aim to reduce the mortality by 33% in 10 years if you don't know that your key target group is men um, who are dying very young. Now, why do men die uh, so young? Immediately the answer is, oh, they smoke a lot and they drink a lot. Um, and that is, is going to lead to us really failing. Um, uh, because if we go to the symptoms, the risk factors um, and their behavior in, the, in, in men of that age, we're going to stop ourselves asking the question, why are these men smoking so much? Why are they drinking so much? And so the structures in society that lead men, I, I've had 
uh, when, I've, when I've gone to the east of Europe and asked these questions, I get really surprising answers. <coughs> um, some are offensive, so I won't use them here. But uh, one, I've seen how uh, when, you, when you grow old in our country, um, you're demented and you don't find care and your life is not worth living. I'm going to enjoy it now. Intentionally, I'm going to smoke and drink. And I don't care what happens. The reality is if you don't have a certain amount of hope beyond, uh, beyond a certain age or you don't feel that there's going to be a network or if family breakdown is immense or if unemployment is very high, you are going to get the conditions which will result in the behaviors, which will result in the mortality. So one appeal that I make, I'm being told to stop, and I, I, I have two more of these questions to ask, so I'll give Andrew the chance um, uh, to provoke them if he wants, but thank you. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to you, but I, I'm keen that we get the others in as well. Kate, Katie, so we've heard from the government and the policymakers, as it were. Let's hear a little bit from the perspective of the patients and from civil society. Tell us a little bit about what role they should be playing, what the frustrations are, maybe some examples of best practice. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I guess I want to start with a, a cautionary injection of optimism in the discussion, because I completely agree with Gordon that, you know, not enough is being done and we're seeing progress is... Um, not as fast as we would like to see. But let's just think that rewind 10 years to 2007. NCDs were absolutely nowhere on the global health and development agendas. We had the Millennium Development Goals, which were rightly directing resources and political priority around a set of development issues, including health. NCDs were absolutely nowhere um, on the agenda. We hadn't raised the issue up, the political... Um, agenda up to heads of government and heads of state level at that point. Also, there wasn't really a sense of consensus around actually what works in terms of prevention and control. We were beginning to get there, I think, but we didn't have real consensus around the, the what works in terms of what governments should be implementing on prevention and control. And also from a civil society perspective, we had very, very strong civil society organisations around the specific areas of NCDs, such as UICC and cancer and IDF on diabetes, etc. But at that point, we didn't have this kind of movement that had brought together these different issues and together working on their shared agenda around NCDs. So if you rewind to today, I think we should celebrate some of the successes that we have at the global stage, because I think it's important. I think the NCD community is often too hard on itself of, of the lack of progress, and I think we need to celebrate the fact that at the global level, we are now really recognised on the global stage. And as Gordon said, NCDs and the Sustainable Development Goals, that wouldn't have been even a, a, you know, a question 10 years ago. But obviously, as has been highlighted, the progress has been too slow at the national level. Um, you know, recently WHO put out their new progress monitor for NCDs. And what that showed us was that less than half of countries around the world have national NCD plans and national targets. How can we assume that progress is going to happen at the national level if governments haven't even got the foundations in place in terms of what they're going to be doing and what targets they want to reach in the next 10 to 15 years? It's just not going to happen. Um, also, in terms of the progress monitor, what it showed us was that even though now today we have consensus around the best buys, as we like to call them, implementation of them has been too slow. 16% of countries have implemented effective tobacco taxes. 35% of countries have implemented um, banning advertising to, to children. And around a quarter of countries actually have in place today kind of basic NCD services on the treatment and management side of things. So it's obvious that Things are moving too slowly. But one area that I think is, is really a bottleneck to progress, and political leadership has been mentioned, it's, it's obvious that that is a, is a challenge. But the one that we're really focused on in, in the NCD Alliance is resources, is funding. Um, even though we've seen NCDs rise on, up onto the political health and development agenda, fantastic, what it hasn't done is actually translate into more resources going into the issue. If you just look at, for example, the development aid, um, which over the past 15 years has been a major proportion of funding for global health around the world, less than 3% of $22 billion of development assistance for health is currently going to NCDs. And what that means in real terms, take 2014 as an example, 
One billion dollars of development assistance is going to NCDs. Yet we know that this is the major cause and killer around the world. We know that every year 15 million people are dying av avoidably and preventably. So why is so little funding going into the issue? And I think that's one thing that we, you know, we really need to kind of look at and focus in on. I guess the other thing we need to just be kind of conscious of in, in, in NCDs is that what we're actually asking governments to do is not particularly politically easy or appealing. You know, the, the general kind of response that we get from, from governments on NCDs and around the world is, you know, NCDs are really complex. They're, they're very difficult issues to be dealing with. Secondly, they're very costly. You know, it just costs too much. Thirdly, these things are going to actually take many, many years to, to resolve and see an impact. I'm only in my position for three years or five years. How am I going to show my taxpayers that I'm actually you know, having an impact on health um, in that country? So the actual nature of NCDs as an issue is, is really quite difficult to kind of push in terms of progress. But I think as, as Sri Lanka has, has shown, you know, it... If you do have the leadership both within the Ministry of Health and at the very top with presidents and prime ministers around the world taking on the issue, you, you can see real progress. And I think what we need to learn is how we can clone the Minister of Health of Sri Lanka uh, because it's quite impressive of, of what you've been able to do. And you've set yourself an extremely ambitious target, you know, reducing premature mortality by a third by 2020. That's even faster than the rest of the world has committed to. So... We need to really focus on you know, what have been the success factors in, in Sri Lanka and how we can pass them over to other low-middle-income countries that are really struggling at the moment in terms of generating progress. Thanks, and I'll come back to the question of financing, very important. But, but Stefan, let me turn to you now. And, and we've heard already a little bit around the role of industry, some positive, some negative. I mean, tell us a little bit your perspective and what role do you think industry does have in partnership and investment and, and initiatives that would push the NCD agenda? So first and foremost, I think industry will continue to uh, play its major role that it has played in the past, which means to innovate new medicines. And uh, if you look at the successes that we've had, especially in NCD over the past years, um, it's, it's quite amazing, actually, to look at cancer, how it has become uh, to some degree treatable, and I think we're just at the beginning. Uh, we're going to make cancer if not a curable, but certainly a chronical disease over, over time. Look at cardiovascular medicine, uh, look at diabetes. Some of these things have, have made significant advances in terms of uh, allowing people to live with their disease uh, as, as a, just as a normal person. But what we see as well, and this is why we're asking ourselves to, to, to put these uh, sustainable goals uh, ahead of us, that it, this is not enough. And actually, sort of like um, what is happening in the world is working despite of all the innovation. Things get worse rather than better on, on certain fronts. So there is a great deal of education that needs to be made and a great deal of support in linking up the different components of care uh, to actually get there. We had a different discussion over lunch together with Her Royal Highness on um, the fact that innovation alone will not do the trick. If you don't have a system in which you can actually deploy the innovation to patients, uh, you're not going to get there. And uh, if you take Africa and cancer, for example, uh, we were discussing about the example, and, and it really resonated with me, that you can have all the access even to drugs and the most, uh, most innovative drugs even if you don't have a system to distribute them. And if you don't have a uh, a medical system to actually monitor patients. If you want to supply cancer drugs to African patients, but then you cannot monitor them for uh, neutropenic events, uh, you're, you're potentially causing even more uh, harm than you're going to cause good. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a joint effort, which is why I believe that from our industry perspective, we more and more come into what we like to call integrated care solutions, where we bring together medicines on the one hand side, together with devices, with diagnostics, with digital solutions and other services, and try to bridge these different silos that uh, I think are the, the biggest impediment to, uh, to creating good care. And I would disagree with something that was said prior, prior that we shouldn't create uh, this uh, common language and win-win win win solutions. If we all fight each other, we're going to just do that. We're going to remain in our silos and we're not going to do more than optimize the silos. And I don't think that's going to be sufficient. So, so innovation is one thing, 
access, which we heard a little bit about earlier, is another. What, what more can the industry do there, actually, to make particularly sort of, you know, a package of quite low-cost interventions effectively much more widely distributed and available? So this, earlier this, uh, this year, 23 uh, CEOs of, of leading pharma companies came together uh, to uh, uh, create the initiative that, which is called Access Accelerated. And here it's, it's exactly what you're saying, too. First of all, to create a common understanding about some of these problems. Uh, and I'm not talking about even breaching out in the first place to others. It's just a recognition of industry that they need to play a greater role in here. And the fact that you have 23 CEOs coming together and subscribing to that to a, to a same goal it will create scale by itself. Uh, and I think that's important. And anything that we do, that we always need to think about, is, is it scalable? Can we, can we do something meaningful? And then there again, uh, I think we need to uh, branch out and create partnerships with others. Uh, again, when we talk about access to drugs, we need to, I think, distinguish between uh, what types of drugs are we talking about. We heard about Sri Lanka, and uh, we all know that 90% of the drugs on the essential drug list, they're in the, in the public domain, so they're, they're generic medicines. In my view, it's difficult to understand how generic medicines, especially in the emerging countries, cost more than in the developed countries. If you, if, you get the, if you take the German healthcare system as an example, or take the American healthcare system, generic drugs are available for pennies. They're actually so cheap that some people no longer produce them because there is no in incentive to producing them, which is another problem, uh, which ca causes eventually shortages. But you should be able to price generic medicines at a cost plus price. Now with innovative drugs, I think that's a little bit of a different story. An innovative drug today, and I, I, don't wanna, I don't want to pound that too much, but an innovative drug where you need to have, especially in chronic medicines and where you need to prove outcome uh, to get reimbursement uh, either by regulators or by payers, you're easily uh, in, in a, uh, a nine-figure, uh, easily, nine-figure number in terms of developing medicine. I can tell you that from first-hand experience because I do... Uh, design those, let's say, hosts of studies, and when you develop a new diabetes drug today, where it's mandatory from an, from an FDA perspective to give uh, outcome proof, which is cardi basically cardiovascular no harm proof, but which results in large patient populations that you need to study in order to prove that, you're very quickly in one study in an order of magnitude of $300 million. But with one, million, with one study, you will never get uh, regulatory approval. So we're talking about massive investments in that space, and there needs to be a recouping. Now, I understand that we should not recoup all that money in Sri Lanka, uh, because Sri Lanka cannot afford that. But imagine we're in a place where then the health minister of Germany or the uh, payer system in the United States, uh, States says, well, uh, we're not willing to pay more than Sri Lanka either then innovation breaks down. So we need to come up with a way of tiering our prices in between the different regions in the world and depending on economic wealth and affordability that goes with it. And I think industry has shown many ways how that is possible. A good example is, is probably Hep C. Uh, Hep C has been, and, and the manufacturers for Hep C products have been largely criticized for high prices. Uh, that has not been so much the case in the developed world. Uh, where they have very quickly agreed to, to lower prices. Gowden, maybe coming back to you on this, I mean, it's true, obviously, hypertension, metformin, uh, you name it, there's, there's many drugs that could have a huge impact that are generic. What more do you see could countries do, perhaps, to pool together in order to push down availability of these generic, non-patented medicines? If I may, I'll, I'll generalize that because uh, Stefan uh, made a point about win-win and not win-win. Um, I, I, I am trying to broaden our vocabulary, but not to exclude the potential for win-win uh, situations. S salt and trans fat elimination, for example, salt reduction and trans, these are clearly places where industry and the public health community can really work together to the access to generic drugs, extremely important, and we, we are completely of one voice. <clears throat> what I want to uh, reach out to the general uh, public health community is also to realize that limiting ourselves to that repertoire um, 
is, is to some extent naive and that we do find that we're constantly faced with opposition, um, such as described uh, by the minister, um, where win-win is attacked by divide and conquer or by zero-sum approaches, um, that uh, the profit motive ends up being stronger than the public health motive, health and all policies being proposed slapped back as trade in all policies. Um, look at the uh, alcohol situation in Europe, for example, and you, you, you can see that it's extremely difficult to go in with a a priori win-win approach. Um, no, which dagger is going to come next is, is more likely. So the, it's, it's extremely important for public health community to have a broader scale. Um, and in, in this area, um, maybe I, 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 I don't want to come out as a, as a fanatic or an obsessed. I, I'm actually quite interested in uh, an evidence-based, careful approach to making changes within a very short uh, period of time. This is the concern. So the question we ask ourselves are not just which are the best buys, but which are the fast buys, which ones will give us um, a really quick return. Very clearly, um, in the behavioral field, it's price, availability, and marketing of tobacco and alcohol. The other aspect is, and here is where I come to, to Stefan's uh, main point and, and conclude, um, is that if we have uh, only 10 years left, those people who are going to die of in 2028 from heart attacks or strokes have hypertension and diabetes today. Um, and it is extremely important <coughs> for the public health community to really raise the priority of management, of access to drugs, access to technologies, of deploying to primary healthcare. And here there are ample opportunities for collaboration um, with industry at the national level, even at, uh, at international. This must be more of a priority than it is because sometimes in the health promotion field, we're a bit too careful not to medicalize things, but in the targets on, on SDGs require us to, to, to do some medicalization and to invest in, uh, in, in the treatment, not just in the prevention. Let's just keep on that theme of funding for a second, maybe, Minister. Um, yes, I mean, we were talking a little bit about uh, generic drugs, and obviously one challenge for relatively small countries is you, you sometimes have uncertainties in supply, um, other frictions, relatively low volumes, which can maybe weaken negotiating power. Is there a scope even in medicines for kind of more poor procurement of drugs that are relevant for NCDs, including generics? Do we need a sort of global fund for NCDs, do you think? Or are there other you know, partnerships we need between domestic and international resources to really provide a step change. Yeah, purely. It's fine, it's fine. Just speak up. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, uh, speaking now, when, we, when I uh, reduced all the essential drugs, the 48 generics, about over 400 uh, branded uh, drugs came down in prices in the market. So actually, we use the generic uh, drugs uh, in the state sector, but in the private sector, all the brands are available. So the uh, actual to overcome the other problem was that in the uh, state sector, sometimes the, when I became the minister in 2015, every day there was drug shortage. Between 44 to 79 drugs were in short. So there was a problem. But then I asked uh, <coughs> the, my state pharmaceutical corporation how much of drugs you have destroyed by 31st of December 2014. They said 350 million worth of drugs. So that means uh, nobody knew about the balance. So <coughs> then we actually, I, uh, with the, uh, my Ministry of uh, uh, Digital uh, affairs, uh, that ministry, I did the software. And today, no drug is short because uh, I have given powers for all the directors in the hospital if there is a shortage of uh, any pharmaceutical. So then he can look it in the, uh, on, um, and the computer 
and online you can see actually where the drug is available uh, the closest and to buy and uh, taking and handover done online so the regional director will transport the drug so now the same drugs that i supply but that is enough for the entire state sector mm -hmm. the same way the other thing what i do is that actually i have started uh, manufacturing our own drugs in my country the same drugs so the we, i have another uh, state uh, company called the state pharmaceutical manufacturing corporation in the state pharmaceutical pharmaceutical manufacturing corporation i have got the jica the japanese uh, aid to uh, increase now at the moment we produce about 2 billion um, quantity to increase uh, in uh, next year end of next year to 4 billion that production in the state sector the same way i have given uh, we have the government has given lot of tax concessions for the drug manufacturing so i have already signed 46 uh, agreements to manufacture the same pharmaceuticals in the country so about by 2020 i will have almost all the drugs uh, manufactured in my country so there won't be any shortages and the prices also will be very reasonable D dina you talked about uh, that importance of the human resource financing funding function as it were even within governments to, to really prioritize ncd so what's your take do is it is it primarily or significantly a domestic resourcing issue or do we need more international partnerships and funding to drive ncds I think you need both, to be honest. Um, there's definitely, uh, there are definitely inefficiencies, and I'm sure, Your Excellency, you found that. There were many inefficiencies in, like you said, with drugs expiring uh, and so on. So there are so many inefficiencies that I am very sure that you can create funds just by solving these inefficiencies. And many developing countries certainly face that. So that's one. But I also believe we need... Um, funding, uh, global funding for uh, NCDs, if it's possible. I know um, we know that it is the number one killer. It's affecting the whole uh, global population. Uh, we need more uh, funding available for countries seeking support, uh, you know, after they've done their bit and they've uh, maximized whatever they can do. You know, you need uh, this kind of support similar to what was afforded to AIDS. You mentioned the city challenges for cancer, for example. I don't know if you want to say a couple more words yes. there about that model, which is a partnership for yes. funding. What I love about the city cancer challenge 2025 is that it is very logical. I mean, I know it's a very, you know, I'm biased, but honestly, when I um, went for the election for UICC, I had in mind something practical because I've seen firsthand all the... Uh, inefficient things that were happening on the ground and our story at the King Hussein Cancer uh, Center and Foundation really prove, proved all of these issues. So when I heard that they have already started thinking about the city cancer, I said, oh my goodness, I wish that, that we've had this kind of model when we started our own revolution of um, you know, delivering cancer care. Uh, I'm sure we would have definitely cut the time in half to reach where we've reached right now. What I love about this model is it starts with a plan. Many, there are many global uh, institutions. There's so much goodwill around the world. People want to help, but what they do, they help ad hoc, in an ad hoc way. I gave an example at my other panel. I heard once that there's a certain organization in the US, uh, you know, wanted to help a country in Africa by implementing uh, early detection on breast cancer. When that very country didn't even have treatment. So what they did is they've ticked their box, oh, we're doing some global health, we are helpful. But at the same time, they've made a person in that country, a woman in that country, worry about her breast cancer, possibly three years earlier, when the end result is, is death anyways. So when you don't have a plan, and that's what the CCAN does, they, first of all, they, they don't sign up a country unless they, first of all, um, uh, guarantee two things. One, that they have the political will, because you know, you're excellent. If there's no political will, nothing will happen. Two, the fact that they will 
they will work multi-sectorially. And, and that's amazing. It's, you know, it's so easy to band about this name, multi-sectorially, but I think Sue from the CCAN, the manager of the CCAN 2025 team, to actually have people from different sectors sit on one table and smile at each other, you know how difficult that is. So that's amazing. The third thing is the plan. Planning, 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 and doing an assess a gap an analysis plan to see the gaps and to see the opportunities. And the fact that the country itself invests in its own, you know, they're not just passively waiting for help. They're actually rolling up their sleeves and looking in what they have and what they don't have. That also encourages the other party that's helping. I always tell partnerships, they are best when both parties do their bit. You can't just passively say, help me. You have to do your bit as well. And I've seen that too. For example, I've had some, I've been trying to help some cancer care uh, communities in Gaza and in, in Palestine. And then I hear these stories. Some MD Anderson wants to do something to build a hospital in Gaza. Then somebody else is trying to build the Turkish, I don't know, government wants to do something and build another cancer hospital. Nobody's doing a gap analysis. What is there? What is needed? What is capable? Imagine if both of them, they join together on a plan. And that's what the CCAN does. There's a plan. And, and everybody then, you know, once they know their analysis, they know what they need, then the UICC with its 1,000 plus members and its partners from the UN, World Economic Forum, uh, uh, private sector, Access Accelerated. Imagine having all these amazing partners then they slot in exactly what, with what is needed, not in an ad hoc way. And then everybody sees the impact. And this has not been the case before. It was never in the right order. Perhaps we need some challenges like this for some of the other NCDs as well. Yes. In fact. Katie, Katie you, you touched on the under investment, under financing situation at the moment. Of course, there's a lot of debate around universal health coverage and so on at the moment. But, any examples that you can cite where mobilization perhaps around civil society and so on has helped both domestic and international resources to step up and what, what more needs to be done there? Sure. Well, first thing in terms of the financing piece, I think it's important to recognize that the discussion around financing for development and for global health has changed a lot in recent years. I mean, I think there was in recent years an over-reliance on development aid and development assistance and now obviously the shift is much more about domestic resource mobilisation. It's governments that should be really investing in their population's health, um, as well as development aid being the second bucket, but then also looking at kind of private sector investment and sustainable business models of how we can catalyse sustainable resources for NCDs and health more broadly. Um, as I said earlier, I mean, where, where we're really seeing a, you know, a major challenge is that all of the development partners that we, we speak to um, really see the sustainable development goals as a new era and that it's very much up to governments to be you know, investing. So they're almost putting their hands up and saying, no, this, is, this isn't what we're going to be funding, um, which is slightly concerning because there are a lot of governments out there, countries out there, that really do need some catalytic funding to get them on the road to be having effective entity prevention and control systems in place then needs that catalytic funding. So in terms of kind of letting them off the hook, you know, we're doing a lot of advocacy to make sure that development agencies are taking an interest. But as you say, I mean, domestic resource mobilisation, there's now the big push around universal health coverage coming from Dr Tedros at WHO um, and others. And what we know at the moment in terms of um, expenditure on NCDs at the national level, the vast majority is still out of pocket. Um, so it's pushing vulnerable populations and families into, into catastrophic poverty. Um, but where you're beginning to see some really interesting progress is building upon the kind of win-win discussion earlier. It, it's, it's the likes of Mexico's of this world with the SSB tax, where you are beginning to see you know, effective taxation on unhealthy products, unhealthy, unhealthy commodities, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, sugary sweetened beverages. Um, and not only does that show that it reduces in terms of consumption of those products, but it's also a domestic resource um, mobiliser for the country. So we're beginning to see examples of, of good practice, but I think overall, at the global level, it's, it's really slow. There's always this discussion, as, as you kind of alluded to earlier, of you know, do we need a new global fund for, for NCDs? I mean, our, our message all along has been we need more resources for NCDs. It's very, very clear. 
But in terms of a new global mechanism, a new global fund, I think it's very, very unlikely and very un unrealistic. But what we actually need to be seeing much more of at the global level is the existing global mechanisms, Global Fund, Gavi, the Global Financing Facility for Women and Children's Health, focusing on NCDs more. And they're beginning to do it. You know, the Global Fund has recently kind of opened up a new window around health system strengthening, which is a really important step forward. But there's a lot more that the global, you know, architecture for health more broadly can be doing to focus on NCDs than it is at the moment. Thanks. I th um, we should open it up a bit. So who, uh, who in the audience has a question, please? You can see any hands. No one? <laughs> Come on. Be bold. Yes, one at the front here, please. Uh, do, do please introduce yourself as well. Yeah, thank you very much for the um, wonderful presentation and listening on my side. Uh, my name is Samuel. I work with Robert Bosch in Ghana. Uh, my question comes to you, uh, Honorable Minister. I mean, the first time I uh, read about you was when I had the, uh, or read the World Health Organization's report that um, Sri Lanka had eradicated malaria. So I was like, wow, um, this is really wonderful to, to hear. So I dug a little bit into your profile. Now, sitting here and listening to all the amazing things that you have done, it tells me where you are leading your country to. My question is, um, there could be many government officials here uh, who are listening to you, what would you say to help them as a leadership to have the political will to be able to implement some of these things which you have been able to do in your country? And uh, secondly, um, some of the modules and the policies that you have implemented already, do you already have them, let's say, on your website or something that other governments can also look at as a working module and try to tweak it a little bit to uh, make it feasible and uh, be able to implement it in their respective countries. Thank you. Actually, <clears throat> the number one is that you must have the, one is the political leadership and the courage as the Royal Highness already advocated. If you don't have that, you can never implement it, anything. You know, when I reduced the, when I gazetted the uh, maximum retail prices of drugs, the pharmace pharmaceuticals, <clears throat> the, all the ambassadors of the European Union came to my ministry. They have met the Prime Minister. Prime Minister has said that he cannot intervene. Then they all came. So we discussed, myself and the, the chairman of the National Medicinal regulatory authority we have, one of the professors of pharmacology, famous professor. Then we explained to the, him, them, how we uh, actually brought the, the spices uh, down. We explained the whole thing, then all the ambassadors said, it is very scientific, very rational. But the balance is a political decision that they cannot intervene. So they came with all the multinationals because their only plea was not to bring down the prices of the European uh, Union and the American prices, American drug company. But, but we, we stood up very firm. The same way we were very rational and very uh, reasonable, you know. Then they accepted. When I taxed 90%, uh, I taxed uh, the tobacco. Then the chairman of the global company from Britain, he came down to Sri Lanka. That is a 134-year-old investment in the country. Even my prime minister was a little shattered, saying because 134-year investment, if they withdraw, is very bad for the country. But I calculated so much well, because I was listening to one of the WHO workshops. Uh, there only I got the idea about uh, the taxation up to 90%. So then uh, he also came and there was, they said then they will have only 1% profit. So they cannot manage the company, they will have to close down. It was real crisis. So I am only one minister, but there are so many in the cabinet, Minister of Finance, he said uh, that uh, even uh, the, uh, the 
the benefits, the, the, the revenue to the government from the tobacco will come down so, so much down, so they have, he won't be able to even the balance the budget uh, deficit with all that. But my president stood very firm, the former health minister, now he's the president, he's the first person who brought, uh, who actually brought the tobacco 80% uh, 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 pictorial covering, but the then president actually reduced it again to 60% on the pressure of the tobacco companies. Then he, the first person, tried to bring the, the MRPs, but he couldn't do that at that time. So he stood with me. So he said, I came to power to reduce smoking, not to run tobacco companies. If the tobacco company cannot uh, operate, they can go. But I will have to look after the health of my people. That was my pledge, he said. So I won the day. So <clears throat> then they said only 1%. Then I sat with him and I, I argued. Then finally when I asked certain questions, he said he will come back to me. Up to now he has never come back on, the, on their explanations. So as you have uh, very correctly, you have told uh, the, uh, your Royal Highness, it is the actually we have to be we have to be very rational also, and we must do a lot of studies and come to the conclusion. Then you have to implement. You can't listen to everybody. So now, um, finally, I will appeal one thing. What this with the World Health Summit? I am very happy to see a Royal Highness as being so progressive and so reasonable. <laughs> I will tell all all the other leaders when I meet. If a Royal Highness can be so uh, concerned about the people's health, uh, the poor people, then why not all other people who are elected by the votes of the common man? She is not elected. She, 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 she is a princess. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the second time we in the world, we heard about Princess Diana doing so much work for the poor people, but she is not only working, she demands the leaders to be courageous and to take the political decision. That is very good. Thank you very much. And you better lead uh, some movement. We will help you. Uh, I, just the, I just briefly on the other question, do you, have you written up or do you plan just to write up in some form examples of these policy yeah. interventions that other governments could use? Okay. Is, that, is that done yet? Or? Yes. Um, um, already that's on the web. Our Ministry of Health, but we, uh, we will um, broaden that. Thank you very much. Excellency, if you can really document uh, your experience and publish it in the Lancet, because, you know, Turkey did that as well. Turkey, again, it's another example of a political leadership. Imagine Turkey, who probably invented, <laughs> probably, you know, they are the ones, what do you say, they you'd smoke like a Turk. They, they have the shisha, they have the this, and they managed to not only um, stop tobacco, it's pure political leadership. Uh, they stopped it, and not only that, they have won the award, imagine, from the WHO five times or something like that, from actually implementing every single line from the Empower from WHO. And it was pure political leadership. So it will be great if you can also document uh, your uh, trials and tribulations and the real life you know, fights that you had. It, it's very important for people to know. Like you said, not to just read the, the uh, just the, what do you say, the academic terms. It's, it's good to know exactly what happened, how it went up and it went down and how the ministers stood by you and so on. Uh, it would be a good uh, example for everybody else. Thank you. Maybe something for the Financial Times more than the lot. Yes. <laughs> or, or maybe the Financial <laughs> Times. <laughs> Uh, who else um, has some a question? Is one there, yeah, please? In the third or two, yeah. Good afternoon, and thank you to all the panelists for really showing leadership and, and uh, giving us a, a great me message. My name is Nema Kaseji. I'm a surgeon. And from the surgeon's perspective, um, my question is, are there any plans to scale up access to surgical care as part of the response to NCDs? Because uh, when we talk about cancer, you need, you need surgery. When you talk about diabetes, you, know, you need vascular access, and that requires surgery. And currently, 5 billion people do not have access to surgical care. So thank you in advance for your, your response. Oh, we can take a few and then I'll... 
Uh, yes, okay, let me, yeah, I think there was another question behind you there as well. Should we take that as well? Which one? There was a gentleman in about the fourth row, I think. No? Okay. Put, put your hands up again, please. Just for there's there's two here. Here. Nothing there? No. Okay, over this side then. Yeah, please, there's one in the second row here. Yeah, thank you, the panel, for the excellent discussion. But my uh, congratulations to the Minister of Health, Sri Lanka. My name is uh, Professor Charles Sivindira from Makere University, uh, one of the leading uh, research institutions in Uganda. Uh, I appreciate all that you have done uh, to scale up the fight against uh, non-communicable diseases, but I'm wondering what uh, what, uh, what have we, or what is your policy on training and research uh, to build the capacity to sustain uh, clinical care uh, for non-communicable diseases? Uh, there was a question about surgery, but you need uh, people, uh, the physicians, you need you need nephrologists. So what, is, what has been your policy on that? Okay. Uh, Sorry, I, I, let me take, take a couple more, sir, so otherwise, because yeah, yeah. otherwise we'll run out of time, yeah. Okay. Is that okay? Um, yeah, there was one here, please. So, maybe just one more after this. Thank you. I'm Raja Elawat from the Hassan II Academy of Science of Morocco. Uh, let me confess that I have been hesitating to attend this uh, workshop or another, this panel discussion or another workshop because we have heard a lot about NCDs, what attracts me is two things, is the name of the, and the affiliation of the speakers, but also it is the only space I can, I thought I can highlight one underestimated NCD epidemic that is nowhere recognized. It's about the autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases, 30 years ago when I started in my country, I was collecting few numbers. And we just start to have some papers, formal papers from the US, from the UK. If we took this disease collectively, it can represent more than cancer and, and back pain took together currently. So it's a kind of disease we are not addressing collectively. It, there, are, there is no premature death, but the morbidity is high. So I'm asking you, and you are the right people to address this question, I think. What are, you, what are we waiting to address this underestimated epidemic until it starts to be a huge one, asking for a lot of money, a lot of funding? Okay, thank you. Um, and there's one more at the back there, near the staircase, please. Yep. And of course, you, you don't just have to ask the panel because I think all the, all the room, I hope, is also interested. You know, it's important to raise these debates more generally throughout the summit. But please, yeah. Harald Nusser, Nevada Social Business. Actually, um, I, I thank you a lot for presenting and showing your leadership. I wish there were more countries like this. Regarding the industry prices, um, my company has put together a program with 15 essential NCD medicines for one US dollar per treatment per month, yet the uptake is super disappointing. It's not only the price to the first level customer, it's those poverty premiums um, taking advantage of the inefficiency of the system and about egos in the system who want to capitalize on the, on the failures. <laughs> which mark up prices to, the prices to the patients. So the final retail price, I appreciate this a lot that you were speaking about this one and not only about the industry's price to the first level customer. What needs to be done, and there, there is an initiative monitoring and evalu evaluation assessing about the higher availability and better price points, higher affordability to the eventual households which need to be monitored and, and tracked let me mention, Boston University is engaging a lot in this monitoring and evaluation um, practices. They are partnering also with Access Accelerated in this, and the data 
which Novartis jointly with Boston University is collecting will be made public and I hope many people look into this and draw their conclusions from this study. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks very much. Well, I'm afraid we're, we're almost out of time, but um, Stefan, maybe I don't know if you wanted to come back briefly on that. Sanofi also has a big track record, also, including also some much more affordable medicines in Africa, for example. Does that resonate, that last point? Yeah, I think it goes even beyond that. Uh, what, what, what we're hearing here is that despite good efforts of pharma to actually give affordable prices in many markets, I'm not aware of Sri Lanka and, and our pricing there, uh, but it, despite that, it doesn't get to the consumer. It doesn't get to the patient, the effort. Because, and this is, the, this is the crux in healthcare. And this is, again, why I so much and, and, and I'm so passionate about getting over the silo um, barriers. Because if you, if you don't integrate in healthcare, you're going to, you're going to get lost in, in the one that you're stuck in. So we need, we need to get uh, out of those. I've sometimes used the image that at least we should have windows in our silos so that we can talk to each other, okay? If we want to stay, stay in them, fine, okay? But we need to create some communicating vessels uh, to, to, so that, that we can talk to each other. And I think that example is a nice one. There's a company who is pledging to bring prices down and then ultimately no one even notices it because it doesn't get to where patients should benefit from it. Okay, thanks. So we had these questions on, on training, clinical development, surgery, and autoimmune diseases. Who else? Uh, do you want to come in on that? Or? Sure. I'll, uh, <coughs> uh, so <coughs> there's much to say on all. So uh, I, one point. Um, in Uruguay, uh, where's this glo the global conference on non-communicable diseases about to start uh, on Wednesday, uh, where at least three of us, on, maybe four, on this, uh, on this panel are going uh, after this. Um, we in Europe are, are going to launch a health system assessment methodology, um, which we have been now using for four years, uh, covering 14 countries. It looks at all these elements uh, from, uh, from price of medicines to uh, training of physicians and surgeons um, and looking at financial protection, and all, but, but looking at them in a comprehensive uh, manner, maybe silos with windows, um, but not, not, not just looking at them as individual diseases, but as a health systems approach. And I think it's a unique uh, example from Europe it's well documented on our website. Launching it is, is too hard a word. We, we've been working on it, and it's all, it's all on, the, on the WHO Europe website. And I highly recommend people to have a look. Um, autoimmune diseases, uh, your, uh, your point is the title of a presentation that um, I made in uh, the European uh, Parliament. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think it's extremely important as an issue to recognize that there are many chronic diseases sitting outside the core four, autoimmune disorders, dementia, um, many genetic disorders, including, of course, autoimmune, but there's a, there's a long list of others. Um, we are constantly torn between keeping the focus on the core four and the risk factors so that action can be focused and opening up uh, to this broad area. Um, one of the suggestions that I made in that presentation was to actually go along the line. You're suggesting that we find the musculoskeletal manifestations of autoimmune diseases, which are very great, require a lot of treatment, palliation, and uh, rehabilitation, and such issues deserve their own priority. And uh, it, it's, it's a partnership that I hope we will, uh, we will develop increasingly over time. But I would suggest not try to put everything under the NCD umbrella, because then it becomes an encyclopedia, and we, don't, we end up with no focus in the, in the actions. Anybody else want to come back on those issues? Minister Brita, yeah. Uh, uh, one thing is now, uh, uh, I think, Stefan, uh, you said uh, <coughs> that the principals uh, actually give uh, reasonable prices. Yes, they give a lot of conf concessions, which is not transferred to the patients. That is correct. The second way, actually, when I reduce the prices, 
you know, they appeal to their principles and the principles reduce their CIF uh, value. So I, uh, the country actually gained over 9 billion rupees from the CIF prices they have brought down to play it in the market. So that means they could have given that price earlier. They were not giving, the manufacturers. They reduced their prices, the CIF prices. So the difference is over 9 billion, billion, 9,000 million in rupees. You can divide it in 150 to make it how, how many dollars, right? That is one thing. And the other thing about uh, another uh, person from the audience uh, raised about the quality. Yeah, even in my country, uh, we go for the quality, not for the price. Even the state hospital, we never buy for the price, only the quality. Because every technical evaluation committee uh, is represented by the consultants from, the, from that uh, specialty. Now, if it is a pediatric drug, only the pediatricians will check the drug. If it is a um, gene and ops, uh, it's a VOG. Like that, it's a ca cardio drugs, it's a ca the cardiologist and the cardiothoracic surgeons will sit and select. So we have said that we have never told or advised anybody to go for the prices, but get that's the best uh, uh, prices. But there are a lot of problems now, even in when I became the minister, there were one brand for one generic. That was the game, right? So whatever the price they say, the government has to buy. A certain Tatsusumab drug from a very uh, reputed uh, uh, multinational company. In rupees, I will tell you, the price was 280,000 rupees. Then I told to see only one drug. So then I told the, my National Medicinal uh, Regulatory Authority, NMRA, President, to check for any more other drugs in the world market. Then they brought the second one, a biosimilar drug, right, a biosimilar drug. So then it was, when it was introduced and came for the tender, now they know there is competition. The price of 280,000 rupees for one dose, that came down to 165,000 rupees. 115,000 rupees came down to that, okay. There was another drug uh, imported from Australia. The drug was $30, one supplier, one brand, one generic, right? They have prohibited all other people to get registered. So sometimes what they do is the same person, you know, they register the other company drugs also, but they don't go for it. They keep it, block it. So the Australian drug was $30 a dose. The second drug was introduced. Then it came down from $30 to $3. <laughs> so, so therefore you can't say because the drug, is, the price is high, it is the quality. It is not so. This is how the brand. And the third person, he wanted, uh, he asked me about the, actually the human resources to combat. Yes, there is a problem. That is one problem where I cannot settle quickly. There were consultants. Then I discussed with the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine and I wanted them to uh, actually produce uh, twice the number that they produce today uh, to uh, overcome the, uh, you know, shortage of uh, consultants. Then for the, uh, for the uh, doc medical officers, now we are starting uh, four more, three more uh, medical faculties and uh, the government has allocated money. And for the fourth one, we have uh, doubled the intake. That is in about, th for about four or five years' time, we will achieve the targets. Then for the nurses, I have started, uh, the, for the first time, a faculty of nursing to train 2,000 people, 2,000 nurses, 500 every year. And also now I am planning to start uh, for the paramedics also. So it will take about four years, but that is the, that is the plan I, we have for the, to overcome that problem. 
Okay, I apologize to, to cut you off. I'm afraid we are at the end, really, of our time, and we need to clone the minister about 50 times, I think, for both his domestic priorities and to, to share his best practice around the world. But I think, I hope you'll agree, some very interesting thoughts. We heard from Katie, a reminder about this still tiny percentage of total SDG and development support that's going into NCDs. We've heard the importance about city challenges and other new innovative models, about the role of the, the drug industry and the WHO in, in highlighting best practice around the world. We didn't have so much time, but unfortunately we, heard, we talked quite a lot about the regulatory and the pushback. We didn't hear perhaps as much as would have been good about positive nurturing of new ideas, including around physical activity, for example, and other ways to encourage uh, promotion for healthier lifestyles. But I think hopefully there'll be more chances throughout the next couple of days and beyond. So do please thank our panel. <laughs>